Um, yeah, the title of my uh, talk will show up later. So, um, I'm located in the uh, in Switzerland at the Basel University Hospital, um, which is in the northwestern corner of Switzerland, um, as you might know. And I want to give you this aerial perspective um, because I want to bring that into analogy for um, further parts of my talk. So, this is Basel, um, which borders quite close to France, Germany. Um, and is the place of Novartis and Roche, as you might know, which has um, always been a highly innovative place for, for new developments in drug making, but also in other fields. And um, the Basel University Hospital is located right within the city, and we've been starting 3D printing um, maybe two or three years ago, and we've um, founded our 3D lab just last year in June. It's a large medical center, and it um, involves all clinical uh, specialities, all medical specialties. It's not as large as the, um, the Mayo Clinic Research Network that we saw earlier today, but it's still of considerable size, and it's been proven that it works really well with the addition of 3D printing. So um, I'm going to talk about hospitals and 3D <laughs> labs, why, how, and what now. And why all that in keeping in at, with that aerial perspective, what is the largest thing that you would think of if you come, if your mind comes to 3D printing? Um, it'll be the macroeconomic reason, kind of. There is um, a big market in 3D printing, and McKinsey Global Institute um, estimates that it'll make about 550 billion US dollars in the year 2025 as economic impact. That's like the large uh, overview. But then when we go down further a little bit, as in every healthcare system in the world, probably the resource Resources are becoming more and more scarce, and um, cost pressure has been increasing. So it's imperative that any hospital that wants to stay ahead stays innovative and um, gains a competitive edge uh, across the other hospitals um, within the area. And this is especially obvious in our region. This is the blue dot representing the Basel University Hospital, and all the other th uh, dots are hospitals nearby, not as large in size as the University Hospital, but still of considerable size and with considerable expertise in parts of the medical field. So there's lots of competition going on, and I guess this map probably applies to any larger agglomeration area in the world with an increasing um, competition. So from there, further down, we come to the internal reasons. We've already heard about the um, outsourcing or the keeping it in-house of the 3D printing. Um, keeping the 3D printing know-how within the house has many, many advantages. There's no dependency on external service providers. Um, the prints that you um, um, construct are available immediately, as soon as they are printed, which takes its time, obviously. and. Um, it's been really very well highlighted by Dr. Morris this morning that they improve the cooperation and communication, not only in the moment when the print is there and in the hand of the surgeons and all the involved surgical disciplines, but also beforehand when the, when the um, referring physician comes down to the, to the radiology department and um, asks for that um, model. And then you start to discuss with them, okay, what, will you, what do you want to see exactly? What, what is your focus there? Okay, we could create it like that. So the cooperation and the understanding of the radiologist of the needs of the surgeon is is very much increased through that internal printing concept. And it expands the possibilities across all disciplines in the hospital. The hospital is there for the patient, obviously, but there's many, many other parts, administrative, um, housing departments that take care of all the things around it. And so I guess that was probably not the picture that you expected in the healthcare session, but that's one of the prints that came out of our 3D print lab as well, because part of our hospital is being constructed anew at the moment, and the building department came up to us and asked, could we just print a, a patient's room with a bed and everything, because we want to we want to play how the how the doctors move into the room and how much space they have with all their with all the stuff that they bring into the room. Um, we want to really visualize that, and we want to try out many um, some variants on that. So um, just to go back on this again, it's this shift of mind that we want to create within the hospital with this 3D print lab. It's not just there for the surgeons and for, for the pathologists or for the radiologists. It's there for everybody. And um, I guess many of you are aware that sometimes you have to perform a repetitive task and something nags you all the time, something does not work, and you think, what if I could have this little thing 
um, printed out some hook where I could put this um, pointer now at the moment so that it would not obstruct my hand or something. And then you could print that in the 3D print lab. And imagine this innovation for the whole hospital and people just thinking they are not just consumers of the medical devices that are there, but they can create them by their own. And that's kind of the the place that we want to be in our hospital. And then there's the radiologic <coughs> reasons to go a little bit further into that. that. I'm a radiologist, so um, I'll have to talk a little bit more on that. Um, the radiologic um, job will be changing. Artificial intelligence will come into our job um, before we know it, probably. It will change our role. Hopefully, we won't disappear, but um, um, it will change our role. Then there's a progressive subspecialization that um, makes the uh, referring physicians, the surgeons, etc., also very, very expert or competent on the imaging. So, one wide question where is the use of the radiologist there if the Sorry, that was too fast. Before, um, for the pictures, if I'm an expert on liver um, of liver surgery, then I might the know the anatomy and the pathologies of the liver as well as he does. So we should look into expanding our service portfolio. And to illustrate that, I want to give a really, really short history of the radiologic report. What has been radiology doing for years? It has been basically deconstructing, imaging the patient, um, this um, model here, for example, and then um, the referring physician got this written report with some words on it. In the best case, it was somehow conclusive. In other cases, you would just get like, we have the impression of being something. So um, there has been a total reduction of this three-dimensional volume on this piece of paper. That's all that he had. Then in the... So we're here. Um, then it's, they, they start to illustrate that with pictures, or you would even get like um, the, the volume rendering techniques. But all that does not, as the previous speaker already said, does not come close to the real 3D representation that you could get generate that. And from the imaging that we do nowadays, we have the possibility to, to generate that. So that should be kind of a part, not in every case obviously, but should be a part of the radiologic report of the future, a 3D model so that the surgeon, that the referring physician can take it in his hands, look at it, discuss, the, discuss it with his students, with his fellows, um, surgeons, whatever. Um, and then there are obviously the patient-centered reasons, and we've heard them many times now, um, the improved patient core, uh, care and outcome, and that's kind of the core of all that that we try to do. We do the uh, better understanding of the complex anatomical relationships, for example, in nephron-sparing surgery. Um, Pre-contouring of implants can save operating time. Um, we can use it for patient, medical, and medical student and resident education. There's probably many more um, fields to, to come and to think of just we already heard about bioprinting and everything. So, okay, we, we are sure that we want to have our 3D print lab now in our hospital, but how would we want to do it? Where is the best place to place it? How should the radiology do it? Or We decided to uh, find a partner and we found uh, him, not him, but the people who do that. And um, the radiology had the printers for some time, also the cranium maxillofacial surgeons. And as you're all aware, they have been doing 3D printing since a long time. This is a model from uh, 1987 by, by uh, Thomas Lambrecht, who uh, happens to work in Basel as well. And so we uh, went for an interdisciplinary approach, and that really proved, proved to to be um, a very part of our success because this joint operation allowed us to bring our expertise as radiologists into this 3D print lab, but also the, the know-how, the advanced print, 3D printing know-how of the surgeons, of the CMF surgeons. And um, one has to say that the communication between the radiologists and the, um, and the clinicians has a little bit declined since the advent of the digital imaging because the surgeon can access the images all the time. He does not have to come down to the radiology department to discuss images, etc. cetera. So there might, we might be a little bit further away from the clinic than we used to be. And um, 
in that case, it is very advantage to have, to have the CMF surgeon with us because he's closer to the to the uh, clinicians, to the other surgeons. He's better involved, and so he knows um, a little bit more what the surgeons actually want and what could be of benefit in uh, when we do 3D printing. Um, and then. Um, if you would ask me, I'd uh, recommend that you start small. Maybe you get one of these machines, or this, or this, or this. There's, no, I'm just kidding. Um, really, s start small if you want to learn. We, we did it like that, and it, it, it worked really well. It, depending on your scope, you're probably very well off with a, with a prosumer or entry-level 3D printer um, that just does fused filament fabrication. If you're more into printing models to visualize anatomic structures, if you're more into going into biocompatible materials, you might think about getting an entry-level SLA printer as pictured here. So, but um, you can start small, and then once you realize that demand goes up or something, then you can go the next step and go further. And then you have to make it simple. That's um, also been stressed by Dr. Morris earlier. Um, just make it open, have the people come into this lab. And so this is the map of the Basel University Hospital, and where would you put the 3D print lab there? This is a really nice house. It's by uh, star architect Herzog de Moron, so it would be quite cool to be in there. Or would you place it here a little bit um, next to the children's hospital, quite close to the children cardiologists? Or maybe here, those are older houses, also very beautiful. But now we decided to put it right into the middle because these are the wards here. This is where the surgeons are. This is where the internal medicine is. Radiology is in the basement, obviously. And this has really been a great location for this 3D print lab because that's where the people come by. And Dr. Morris said that as well. The surgeon does not want to walk across the street into this thing or into this hospital, uh, in this, this building. Um, he just wants to come by between two operations, just check one model or make some, some announcement or just um, communicate something with you, and then he wants to go for his, for his daily routine. So place it really central. And besides the physical placement, make it simple in terms of, um, of um, um, application and um, requestment. You probably both know the difference between those phones. Um, they both can check your email. There's the email application here, there's the email application here, but one worked out for the future, one did not, and I guess you know which one it was, the one that was really simple, and that's how we did it. We implemented a direct workflow from the electronic medical record. The um, referring physician can just order a 3D print, and we have one email box just easy where the two uh, per persons of the 3D lab, me and the CMF surgeon, can check and we'll see what prints are coming in and what prints have to be performed. And from there on, we can work on. The routine cases are directly processed, uh, more complex cases are discussed again. And that's how it looks. You just do this request. You can say, I want to. Uh, have a 3D printed model and you just give some information and this request comes into our inbox and we see in the name of the patient that is grayed out here where he's lying and we have a, a phone number where he can call him back and we get some information about the case so we can guard, get started right away and it is really streamlined and easy for both parts. Um, then you have to define and monitor the process. Um, we already uh, saw some slides of that in other um, in um, the slides of the other speakers, the process is usually quite the same. We export the DICOM, then uh, we segment it in the innovation suite. We do some post-processing, we print it, we archive the files that we have them for further reference, and we do a photo documentation. And um, we have a cloud platform running that monitors all our printers so that we can see which printer is free at the moment. The two upper ones here are free as you can see by those green boxes and the other ones are um, um, occupied at the moment, so that allows us to monitor our printers. And that's what it led us to within this year. So we, um, we had about 4,000 hours of printing time now, and we have nine printers now on site and 11 in remote hospitals and um, one SLA printer. And we print about 34 kilos of material and four liters of raisin. And, and it has been really well appreciated, not only um, by patients and in-house, but also by press mentions. And, so you have your 3D print running now, and um, what's next? What now? Um, you have to start to communicate, or 
if I were a company, I'd say advertise. Um, chances are many potential referrers have not even heard of 3D printing yet. Many do not know the benefits, what you can do with that. Talk to colleagues, inform the public, form projects. Just make sure that people start to understand the benefits that you can that you can bring with the 3D printing. And that's one thing we did, for example, that was our booth at the largest internal medicine congress in Switzerland. It's called MedArt. And um, we just had many models there just printed with a small case vignette displayed beneath so people could walk there and just take the model in their hand and see it. And uh, it, it gained a, a huge interest because Many people, you are all familiar with 3D printing here because you've come to this conference, but many referring physicians did not ever see that and they were, you can print that? How does that work? <laughs> and that worked really well, so involve the public. This is the Blick, that's not quite the Lancet, but it's more like a yellow press um, thing um, in Switzerland, Bild Zeitung in Germany, equivalent, I don't know what it's called in, in Belgium, but um, we had this 3D printed heart, it was actually printed externally, but it came out from our segmentation work, and it gained a huge public interest that we had this model that helped the surgeon in this case of a, of a melanoma metastasis in the, in the septal um, to be operated. So, so if you start with a 3D print lab, go, go to your press department and tell them what you're doing, because chances are that you will gain quite a high interest um, by Blick. For example. And then make it sustainable in the next steps. Create a regional network. As I already said, the, the regional landscape is quite, um, quite crowded by hospital in our area. So we partnered with the Kantonsspital Basel Land and the Kantonsspital Aarau, which is a little bit further away. And um, we work closely together. And in one of the hospitals in Aarau, we have placed the 3D, 3D printer. And if we want to print something for them, we can send the print shop directly there, so someone just has to take it out of the printer, and um, they can work with the model right away, um, because this cloud-based platform allows us to send the prints there. And we also partnered with the university and the Fachhochschule, that's the University of Applied Sciences, because they have a very high material comp competence. I'm a radiologist, not like an engineer, and so um, these people, they really know the stuff for the more complex, uh, print jobs when you want to go into metal printing and everything. They have the equipment so we can partner with them if it gets more complex. And then the last part and probably the most difficult part, try to turn it profitable at some point. It's a work in progress for us. Um, at the moment we have received funding from our hospital. Um, establish some pricing structure that does not scare away the referrers and uh, negotiate with the insurance providers to try to get reimbursement and then start to expand your service portfolio um, if it has not happened um, automatically because it generates this interest. And from my experience, I have to say that the, the expansion of the services that just comes automatically because people ca start to come to talk to you and new ideas are just generated automatically. And with that, I come to the take home. So why would you want to create your 3D print lab? It improves the patient outcome, as we heard. It allows you to stay competitive and innovative, make it interdisciplinary if possible, start small, get one printer, two printers at the beginning, and if it works out, you can you always scale up. And keep it simple. Keep it simple for you, for, the, for your structure, and keep it simple for the referrer so it works. And then start to communicate about what you're doing, educate your colleagues, educate the public, tell them what opportunities lie ahead with 3D printing, try to make it sustainable by forming a network, and in the end, try to turn it profitable. And with that, thank you very much for your attention.